Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike Hoggard here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study. Second Peter chapter 3 is where we're going to be this morning. I got my cup of high-grade uh, Gulf of Mexico oil spill. Uh, fantastic. Nothing like some pure-grade petroleum to get you moving in the morning. Second uh, Peter chapter 3. We're talking about, we've been talking about the false prophets, false teachers, false doctrine, False Bibles, false you name it, they're out there. We've been talking about these guys. Now we're going to talk about the scoffers. And we're going to talk about why the scoffers are wrong. And they're wrong. And if you're a scoffer, if you're scoffing at the Word of God, and you're scoffing at uh, what the Bible says about the future and what the Bible says about the past, I'm here to tell you you're wrong. Now, I don't mean that in a mean way. I don't mean that in an arrogant way as if, I'm glad I've got the truth and you're an idiot. Uh, I don't mean it that way. Um, one of the hardest things for us to deal with in life is the idea that we're wrong. Okay, We don't deal with that. We don't deal with that very well in our marriage. When my wife tells me I'm wrong, and my turn, skin turns green, and I grow muscles, and I rip my shirt, and I'm not really that bad. I don't like being told I'm wrong. I mean, I, that's part of my proud nature that I have as a human being. But when confronted with the obvious truth, and I, and I know a guy, I know a guy, and I worked with him for several years, and he always told me, Hoggard, that's what they used to call me, Hoggard, Hoggard, so I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'm one of these guys that if, if I'm in an argument with somebody, and I know that I'm wrong, I'm never going to admit that I'm wrong. Well, I don't know what kind of person that makes you, okay? But we have that in us. We hate being wrong. But when confronted with the truth, when, when being confronted with the reality of what really is and the evidence and everything else in the world, when we're confronted with the truth, the best thing in the world for us to do is swallow our pride and just say, you know what? I was wrong. I believe that this is right. There's nothing better in life than embracing and accepting the truth. Your alternative to embracing the truth is to scoff at it. So look what's going on here. Look what's going on in our country. We have a military uh, colonel, general, something like that, associated with the Pentagon that writes this millennial report saying that uh, America's problem is that we believe in a millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to deal with that in this Bible study, uh, is that we believe in a millennial reign of Jesus Christ. That's America's problem right there. If we just get past that, and so you know what he is? He's a scoffer. He is scoffing at the Word of God and saying that our, our policies as a nation should not be governed by the promises that are in the Word of God. We should stay away from that. You have the Southern Poverty Law Center that is basically telling you that if you believe in the millennial reign of Christ and the second coming, you're a terrorist. You're a natural-born terrorist to this nation. And we have all of that stuff. You know, we have Janet Napolitano. We have all of these people in, in our country that are launching attacks, lobbing philosophical grenades uh, at, a, at a people who were at one time the backbone and the strength of this nation, those who believed in the judgment of Almighty God. Our founding fathers believed in the judgment of Almighty God. They talked about it in their writings. They talked about it in their speeches. They believed wholeheartedly in the judgment of Almighty God. And this is what we're dealing with because the reality and the truth that you need to embrace and clutch on to is the reality that you are going to appear before the judgment seat of Almighty God. You have a rendezvous, a court date with God, and you're going to have to stand. You are going to be on trial in God's courtroom. God is judging this earth right now, and what we're going to talk about is, is the sentence that he's going to pronounce upon planet earth. So here's what he says, 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Okay, now this would be, this would be applied to uh, every criminal that's out there that thinks they can commit crimes and get away with it. They are willingly ignorant of the idea that they'll get caught. They're, they're just ignorant. They're, and they, they tell themselves, man, I can do this and I'll never get caught. That's what people believe. That's what they tell themselves. So they are willingly ignorant of that. By the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. This is a reference of the world that was before the flood, and we know that because verse 6 says, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. 
And so we go back to Genesis chapter 7. And, uh, boy, you can tell this morning, uh, I did the Watchman broadcast last Sunday and uh, was having a sore throat. And now that sore throat has expanded into this little cold. And I haven't had a cold for a year and a half, so I'm not really having a good time with it. But in Genesis chapter 7, the Bible says, and here, here's what you need to do. You need to take heed because Peter is going out of his way to give you an example of just how severe God's judgment is, okay? Uh, God, God does not have one of these granny paddles. I don't know if you've ever seen a, if you go in these gift stores and see a granny paddle. A granny paddle is this long uh, uh, paddle of wood that has um, this quilting like a pillow on the end of it. So when granny uses the paddle, it doesn't really hurt, okay? God doesn't really have that kind of granny paddle, okay? Uh, now, God knows how to restrain himself, but I'm telling you that the judgment of God is a very severe thing. So we look in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. In the 600 year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, he's even, he's even telling you the year, the month, and the date that it happened. That's how accurate this Bible is. In the 17th day of the month, the same day, that very same day, the, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. You see, I just, I believe that because Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And so it says that um, in verse 18, the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth and the ark went upon the face of the waters and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered now you can you've got two choices here my friend you can either believe the discovery channel account of that which is i think they're produced by bbc you can either uh you can either receive in your heart the tv version of it that says well there was a lo- there was a localized flood at one time and oh it was bad in this area but it didn't cover the whole earth that's impossible everybody knows that You can either accept that and say, oh, well, then I don't have anything to worry about then. I'm going to keep drinking. You can either accept that or you can accept the idea that God judged the entire world. Why? Because he says in chapter 6, in uh, God saw that the wickedness of man was great and the earth, and that every imagination, there's those imaginations again, of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. But I want to tell you what, it looks to me like we're heading into that same scenario once again. That which was is that which shall be. And so if God judged, if God looked on, the, on, on mankind's heart, which God can do, God looked upon mankind's heart and said, you know what, they are beyond redemption. I can't fix them anymore. I can't change them anymore. They have gotten to a point of no return. And God said, that's it. I've, I've, I've enacted my judgment. I've given the sentence. The sentence upon planet Earth and upon all life on planet Earth is death. Now, out of that, God preserves those whom he calls out. So he calls all the animals, seven, un, seven of the clean animals and two of the unclean animals. They go into the ark. No one and his family go into the ark. They are preserved. So in the midst of judgment, watch this now, God is a preserving God. God can save. That's the message of the whole Bible is that God can save those who want to be saved. And I like this. I mean, I just love this verse in in Genesis 6, verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I always tell people, you know, I believe in the exact words of the Bible. I believe they mean something. The reason why Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord is because he was looking for grace. And he found it in the eyes of the Lord. And I will tell you, As long as you espouse an idea, an ideology in your heart that says, you know, what I'm doing is okay, what everybody else is doing is wrong and they're stupid, but what I'm doing is okay, it's okay for me as long as I'm not hurting anybody and I don't have to worry about it, this and that and the other. As long as you hold on to that idea, my friend, you will never, you will never, ever, ever look for grace. You'll never look for it. And I will tell you something. The Bible has a formula for how you can have eternal life. And it says, for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so I will tell you, as long as you continue to hold on to, love, cling to, cleave to your sins and your transgressions and think, well, it's really, it's, there's nothing wrong with this, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. 
As long as you maintain a lifestyle of that, number one, you will never look for grace. And number two, if you never look for grace, you'll never find it. If you don't think that there's anything that you need forgiven for, then you won't seek forgiveness. I mean, you won't do it. I mean, that's just plain and simple. So God sends a message here that, number one, he judges He judges people. The Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell. That's individuals. And then it says, and all the nations that forget God. That is a group of people, citizens of a country, an entire land, an entire people, an entire city. And so individually, God judges people. But corporately, God judges cities, nations, families, groups. And at one point, he judged, he did judge and will judge the entire earth. But... God saved a remnant out to preserve seed. That's what he wants to do in the last days. So if you have this idea that, and let let me read this here, verse 21 of, of Genesis 7, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life and all that was in the dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed, which is upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive and they that were with him in the ark. And the, and the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. And so getting back to Second Peter here, this is what he's referring to. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Okay. So what you need to get across in your mind, you need to, <clears throat> this is the, con- the truth that you need to confront. Instead of being a scoffer, this is what you need to hang on to. Number one, God's already done it, okay? You know how uh, as kids we play this game with our parents, and maybe our kids will play it with us, uh, is that they're going to test us, okay? They're going to test us. I tested my mom and dad. Uh, I tested my mom until she said to me, son, hand me your belt, Okay, and at that point, I knew that it was pretty serious, and so I didn't, I didn't push that line anymore. Children will test their parents. They will see what it is that they can get away with. We have that inherent nature in us uh, as human beings. We want to push the limit to see what we can get away with. So now we're living in a world right now, and uh, I, I will just tell you that the iniquity that is alive in our country right now is is exceeding great look at the stages we've gotten to there was a time in this country when it was a it was a public shame for a girl to end up pregnant out of wedlock it was a public shame because it was an indicative of the fact that there was premarital fornication involved and people say all oh, people back then were prudes and they hated everybody and then blah 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 but i'm telling you that the laws of god we're at one time effective in our society in that we believed that marriage was the foundational basis of a strong society. And so there was a time when it was a, it was a shame for a woman or a girl to end up pregnant outside of wedlock. Now look at us now. About probably, I'd say probably about half, maybe less than that, girls end up pregnant before they're married. Most, most young ladies and young men before they're married or anything else like that. And we're talking about even into the ages of 12 and 13 years old now are engaged in some form of fornication. Okay. That's, and we accept that now to the point now that we see young girls and young boys hang, you go out, you go out to the mall, you see them hanging all over each other. You see them this and that and the other, and you, and you just know what's going on. And so we walk into Taco Bell last night, my wife and my family. And I, 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 boy, you just don't know how, how to react in a situation like this. And I was just running through all scenarios in my mind. Um, when I walked in, I, you know, just kind of glanced over at a table over in the corner. And there was two young people sitting at this table and what looked like an older woman sitting there with her back turned to me. And as I walked in, I saw these two young people, the the young man reached over and kissed the person next to him on the lips, on the mouth. And I and I looked and I thought, boy, that is a that's a strange looking girl that's sitting there next to him. 
And the more I looked, the more I realized, and here was, and they couldn't be any more than 13, 14, 15 years old. Two boys sitting at this table in Taco Bell, Festus, Missouri, with apparently one of them's mother sitting right there, kissing on the lips. They were queer. They were gay. And all throughout that little, the time they were there, they were sitting there holding hands, staring at each other. Do, you, do I love people? Yes. What I wanted to do was go to them and say, God has a better way. The other part of me, what I wanted to do says, you're wicked, you're, you know, I mean, you know how, you know how we feel. And I'm just telling you, right, <clears throat> and for them to be, do, number, one, to, number one, to be doing that in front of, apparently that was one of, their, one of their moms, for them to be doing that in front of their mom. But number two, to be out there in public, in a public place, knowing, knowing that people are going to see them, having no fear, no regret, no remorse whatsoever. You have to imagine this is what God was seeing in the days of, uh, days of Noah. And I'm here to tell you that the iniquity of mankind is growing and growing and growing. We're, we're not getting better. We're getting worse. And to the point now, and you can say what you want to, but I, I, I believe that at some point <clears throat> that open promiscuity, and what I'm, what I'm saying is public promiscuity, and public fornication is going, to, is going to come to a point where it's going to be accepted. And people say, well, you know, I heard a guy one time when I was in high school, well, you see dogs, they don't run around with a wedding ring. Wait a minute, we're not dogs. We're to be better than that. But I promise you that's where it's going. And what I'm telling you is, is that there is a rapid increase of iniquity in our time right now. And God is watching. And God and people think they're going to get away with it. These two boys sitting at that table knew that we have an atmosphere in a situation that exists in our country right now where they are protected. They're protected by laws. They're protected, whereas, uh, I mean, and let's just deal with reality. Years ago in this country, somebody would have beat them to a bloody pulp somewhere, okay? In communities, that just did not exist, okay? Whether right or wrong, whether you say is right or wrong, I'm just telling you, but now we have a situation now where that is accepted in public. And you have uh, Katy Perry going around tell, you know, singing this song, I Kissed a Girl. She is releasing a spirit of lesbianism into these teenage girls who, I guarantee you, 30-year-old women don't watch Katy Perry. Uh, these teenage girls do. And now it's hip to be gay. You have uh, Ellen DeGeneres on TV, and she's one of the most watched people on television right now. It is cool to be a lesbian, and this is where everybody's going. And they think, they think, that they can live out their lives in a sinful, reckless manner, violating the Word of God, and think that nothing's ever going to happen. They're scoffing now at the judgment of Almighty God. And I'll tell you this, that's the extreme. But isn't it the same way when you and I think, as Christians, that we can sin and God will just wink His eye at our sin? And, and, oh, God will forgive me because, you know, I'm saved. I'm, I go to church. You know, I'm, I'm too big for God to bring down. Well, I want to tell you something. None of us are. Okay? My mom used to tell me, son, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And I'm telling you that even as, as Christians, we should never, ever, ever, ever have a mindset that says that we can't fail or we can just do whatever and God's just going to have to forgive it. You know what that is? That's tempting the Lord. And Jesus said, that was one of the things Jesus said to the devil. Thou shalt, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when you just willfully go out and sin and say, okay, I can do this, but see, I, I know that I can go back and give forgiveness. I, you know, we're not right in that. And so let's not scoff and mock the Word of God. Let's believe the warnings that are given to us. I mean, every realm of life has warnings. My goodness, you cannot pick up a, a box of cake mix without there being some kind of warning on the side of it. Okay? Uh, warning. And it's almost where if you're going to make cookies, you have to have safety glasses and a helmet and, and hard-toed shoes and gloves. I mean, that's the world we live in. There are warnings in every aspect of society, but when it comes to morality, 
Oh, no, there can be no warnings of judgment against that. That's judgmental. You're judging them. I'm telling you, God's already judging them right now. And he's given us those warnings. So he says in verse 7, The heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept. And I like this. They're kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. And so now I like the fact, and I, I want to say this before we close. I like the fact that God's word keeps. It keeps. I can tell you that there's been times in my life when, I'll be honest with you, okay? Can I, can, it's just us, right? I mean, there's no one else, just me and you. There's been times in my life when I wasn't sure that I wanted to be a Christian. Okay? I mean, I'm admitting that because probably you've been there or you're headed there. You didn't care. You didn't care anymore. Okay? Sin presented itself. You see, you see, the, I mean, you know, the, the Christian life sometimes bring trials and temptations, and that's why they come, is the devil's trying to say to us, come on. Come on, you don't need this. Come on, you don't need this aggravation. They don't act this way up at the tavern. They all, everybody knows your name up there. I mean, that's how it is. There's been times when I, I mean, I just wasn't sure. There's been times when my life has been an absolute shipwreck, total disaster. And God could have, God had a right and God could have put me out the door. But he didn't. He kept me. He kept me when I didn't want to be kept. He kept me when, uh, and I said when I didn't want to be kept. I, I'm not so sure about that. You know, I, I think that down deep in my heart, I, I've always, always, always wanted to go to heaven when I died, and I still do. But he kept me when I, when I had doubts. He kept me and preserved me when I was going to be a liberal Rick Warren. He kept me and preserved me in the greatest sins that I've ever committed. He's kept me and preserved me at times when... He should have turned me over. And I can't tell you how thankful I am that God has brought me to a place where I look back on my past and say, you know what, God, I'm glad that you kept me. I'm glad that you had some sense when I didn't. I'm glad that you helped me stand when I fell. I'm glad that you helped me to stay put when I wanted to run away. The word, And it's the word of God that keeps things. Okay, So I'm going to say this. How can you believe that God can preserve the soul of man if you do not believe that God has preserved even his word? Because it's the word that has kept the soul, not the other way around. Scholars are not preserving the word. The Bible colleges are not preserving the word. The denominational pastors are not preserving the word. The, God's word preserves itself. It is not incorrupted. It's incorruptible. It cannot be corrupted. How can you believe that God can preserve a nation, a soul? How can you believe that God is going to keep his promise to you when God could not even keep his promise to himself by preserving his word? How can you believe that? It just doesn't make any sense to me that a corrupted Bible can preserve a corruptible soul. How can you believe that? So this is why I believe what I believe about the Bible. Number one, I believe that God inspired it as Jeremiah wrote it, as Peter wrote it. As Peter was writing this down, God was breathing into him the very words that Peter was to write down. Number two, I believe that God preserved this word. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. That's what God said about his word. <coughs> Number three, I believe that God has this word translated for us to believe. I believe that when I open up this Bible and look upon the pages of this King James Bible, I am looking at the pure, incorruptible, preserved, perfectly translated, interpreted word of of God, and it is keeping me. In the darkest days of my life, I went to this Bible. Okay? I didn't want um, seven habits of highly effective people. I didn't want the power of positive thinking. I didn't want the law of attraction. I didn't want Oprah Winfrey. I didn't want any of these self-help techniques. 
in the darkest days of my life, I went to this Bible. In fact, it was this very Bible right here. I went to this Bible because it can preserve and keep me when I have no ability to do it in myself. And so just think about it. The words, the heavens and the earth are being kept right now, kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The day of judgment is what you, is the truth that you need to embrace. The next time you go to a funeral, you need to look at that casket or that urn or whatever it is. You need to look at that and say, that's where I'm headed one of these days. And what's going to happen to me after that? You are going to, for it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. You have an appointment with God's courtroom, and God is the judge. Not me, not the Pope, not Barack Obama, not the King of, of Spain, nobody. You are going to stand before the judge, who, actually, who, by the way, has a record of everything that you did wrong all written down. And you know what's going to testify against you in that day? You know what the Bible says? Your conscience is going to witness against you because you're going to read it and you're going to know you did that. Okay? You know you did. Your, con your own conscience is going to witness and testify against you on that day. Now I'm going to ask you today, are you going to embrace the truth? And the truth is, is that this word can keep you and preserve you throughout all these things, <clears throat> are you going to embrace the truth and the reality that in spite of what you have believed before, you are going to be judged by God, not by a church council, but by God. You're going to be judged by God on the things you have done. And don't give me this, not, well, you know, I, I've always believed that my, my good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds. I've always believed that, really. How come they don't practice that in an earthly courtroom? I mean, you know, let's think about, uh, you know, in this area, there was a guy that uh, kidnapped a young boy by the name of Sean Hornbeck, kept him and pedophiled on him for several years. And then <clears throat> when the thrill ran out on Sean Hornbeck, he went and got another boy, and that's how they caught him. That's how they found him. Should we have an allowance in any of our court systems that we should weigh this guy's good deeds against his bad deeds. Should we do that? No. That would, number one, be illegal. Number two, it would be immoral. There would be such a public outcry. And I'm telling you, we don't allow this in earthly courtrooms. Why should God? He doesn't. The only thing that he's provided for us <clears throat> is not our good deeds because our works of righteousness alone are his filthy rags in God's sight. It's not our good deeds, it's not our merits, it's not our money, it's not our church affiliation, it's nothing like that. The only thing that can stand in our place, in the place of condemnation, is the one who's already done it for you, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that you are going to be judged one of these days, and believe that that judgment is harsh. He said that this, this judgment is a judgment of fire, and buddy, I believe that. Two things in this world I'm afraid of. Number one is electricity, for obvious reasons, if you know my testimony. But number two, I'm a, I, don't, I don't want to burn. I, don't, I can think of a million better ways. I would rather go to ground zero in a nuclear explosion because then in a millisecond you're vaporized rather than to burn to death, much less burn for all of eternity. But that's where you're headed. If you mock and scoff the idea that God is going to judge you one of these days, you're better off embracing the truth and calling upon the name of the Lord, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Next week, we're going to talk about, oh, I love this, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. Lots of biblical evidence. I'm looking forward to getting into that. Anyway, I love you. God bless you. Keep praying for us. And uh, just keep us in your prayers here in our ministry, in our, in our home church, Bethel Church. Pray for us daily, and I appreciate those that do. God bless you. We'll see you on the next Watchman broadcast. Bye-bye.